Welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another action-packed episode of your favorite public affairs programming. We have a lot of uh, stuff to cover today, only two topics, uh, but I'll tell you this, when I was preparing the show, this is probably one of the most important episodes we have ever put together. If everything comes out the way we really, really hope it does, this is going to actually be mind-blowing. I'm serious. Uh, this, this is going to be a very, very heavy subject matter, especially the second part. First part, not so much. That's more current events. Uh, but uh, the second part of our show is really going to really going to mess with you. Uh, I'm warning you now, uh, but it's, it's not going to be too bad, but there's a little bit of... Um, uh, psychological conflict that I've had and I think that you're going to kind of notice the same thing when we get there. So we are going to actually go back in history not once but two times today but the first one was only going back seven years ago and we're going to take a look when we get the health care debate going on we've got the Republican, House Republican uh, plan for the Obamacare replacement uh, has been introduced. We covered that a little bit last week, and as I said then, there's going to be a lot of changes to it. A lot of things got to happen, so this is not a be-all and end-all bill. But we are going to actually take a look at that, because what we're going to do is kind of rewind and say, in order for us to see where the House Republicans are coming from now, we need to go back and see where they were during the original debate for the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and before we do that, we really have to take a kind of a closer look at the um, at what the Obamacare bill actually does. So we're going to actually compare Obamacare to buying coffee at a coffee shop. Let's take a look right at the at the video. Yeah, I'd like a large coffee with nothing in it. Okay, that will be seven hundred and forty-three dollars. What are you, crazy? I just want a simple coffee. Well, sir, in order for the government to allow this establishment to sell coffee, there are certain minimal essential coffee benefits that they are required to provide. Like what? They are legally required to provide milk, a travel mug, a straw, and numerous other items that the government has deemed necessary for you to have. Okay, first off, I don't want a straw, I don't want a travel mug, and I don't want any milk in my coffee. I just want a simple coffee. I don't think you understand. This is for your own safety. I don't care if you think it's for my own safety. I'm responsible enough to drink coffee of my own. The only thing that I want is a basic coffee. That's it. Well, the government has deemed it necessary for you. Thanks, but no thanks. I'm just going to go to another coffee shop and get exactly what I want. What is that going to get you? That's going to get me a coffee. No, you don't understand. This is a government mandate. Any coffee provider must comply with these regulations or their license to do business will be revoked. Fine, then it looks like I'm not going to be buying any coffee at all. Hold on there, not so fast. What? I'm not going to be purchasing any coffee. It's a free country, isn't it? <laughs> of course it's a free country, or at least we like to tell you that. You're free not to purchase this coffee, however not doing so will require you to pay 1% of your yearly income as a penalty. What? I make 50 grand a year. That means I have to pay 500 bucks to this coffee shop to not receive any coffee in return? Of course you won't have to pay this coffee shop $500. That would be ridiculous. Oh, okay, good. You'll have to pay it to the government. And then the next year you'll need to pay $1,000, the year after that $1,250, and then whatever arbitrary number the government wants after that. Okay, okay, this is some kind of joke, right? Where's the hidden camera? We had to institute this policy because some people needed coffee, whether they could pay for it or not, and it had to be provided to them. This placed an undue burden on everyone else, so our solution was to place an undue burden on everyone else. Well, who forced the providers to give away the coffee for free? Well, the government required it, whether those people could pay for it or not. So there was a problem created by forcing vendors to provide free coffee to people. And now the solution to that is to force other people to purchase more coffee at ridiculous rates. Well, you might want to have coffee in the future, so we need to make sure that you pay for it now, whether you actually want it or not. We like to call it the individual shared responsibility payment. It sounds like a contradiction in terms, because it is. Every time you buy coffee, we need to take most, I mean some, of that money and provide coffees free of charge to those who we think need it. 
and also to people who consistently vote for us. Plus, we can then use that money to purchase a website for millions of dollars that simply won't work. Wouldn't it make more sense to just let me pick what I want to buy, and the provider pick what they want to sell, and let us handle it amongst ourselves? But then how would we pay for programs that you don't want? I'm, I'm well, that was kind of a synopsis of what uh, we're dealing with. And of course, we, it didn't get here overnight. It really didn't. This has been four or five decades in the works where government would add one thing and try, essentially it comes down to this, and we're seeing this in society at large, in, in all aspects of society. It is called the safety net. That's really what it is. Everybody wants to have a safety net for everybody, and it's like going bowling, if you remember how to do that, and you used to have the gutters. Well, we can't let anybody go and throw a gutter ball anymore. So in all aspects of our lives, we have to have the, you know, the uh, foam bumpers that go into the gutters to keep the ball going into the uh, main part of the lane. That's the way we're, we're at in life right now. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, can't do this, can't do this, can't do that. The whole litany of the stuff that you cannot do, thanks to government regulation, is all designed to keep you safe. Nobody is allowed to take a risk. That's what part of the problem is, and that's part of the problem in how we got here with the health insurance industry. Not just the insurance industry, but all aspect of uh, medical care. I mean, even take a look at medical malpractice insurance. Why do, why, one of the things that nobody talks about is why it costs so much to do business and forgetting about medical malpractice. Insurance for doctors is outrageous. Now, there are medical malpractice cases that are legitimate, so I'm not saying that, that uh, everything is frivolous. No, trust me on that one. Uh, but the fact is, if you've got to carry this insurance and comply with this regulation and everything has to be done, everything has a cost, that cost gets passed down to the consumer, which is you. So that's how we got here. So now, as we see the House Republicans go in one direction with their bill, again, we covered that last week, we're going to take a look at what uh, Congressman Paul Ryan, Speaker Ryan, at that time he was just a uh, member of Congress, this is February 26, 2010. So keep in mind, the Senate had already passed the Affordable Care Act on December 24, 2009, with a vote of 60 to 39. So the Senate had already passed the bill. Now, Barack Obama has this big health care summit, and that's where Democrats and Republicans were all invited for a roundtable discussion. Essentially, the roundtable was meaningless because nothing came out of that anyway. But here is then Congressman Paul Ryan speaking at the health care summit. I'm, I'm just going back and forth here, Mitch. <laughs> I think we're just trying to go back and forth, but that, that's okay. Paul, uh, I was about to call on you, if that's all right. Go ahead. All right, here, Rob, here's basically what we're, what we're looking at. The difference is this. We don't think all the answers lie in Washington regulating all of this. So the problem with the approach we're seeing that you're offering, which I do believe, Senator, is very different than what we're saying, is we don't want to have sit in Washington and mandate all of these things. So what you're doing is you're defining exactly what kind of health insurance people can have. You're mandating them to buy this kind of health insurance. And so we simply say, look, if the National Restaurant Association or the National Federation of Independent Business, on behalf of their members, right. wants to set up an association health plan, we think they'll probably do a good job on behalf of their members. Let them decide to do that instead of restricting insurance competition by federalizing the regulation of insurance and by mandating exactly how it will work, you make it more expensive and you reduce the competition among insurers for people's business. We want to decentralize the system give more power to small businesses, more power to individuals, and make insurers compete more. But if you federalize it, and standardize it, and mandate it, you do not achieve that. And that's the big Paul, difference we Paul, have. would you yield? Or, Mr. President, may I ask him to yield? Yeah, the, uh, the, we're not in a formal hearing here, <laughs> okay. so the, uh, go ahead. Paul, I read, your, I read your road, and I thought one of the things that you said is that there should be some minimum consumer protections in the exchanges that you propose, did I get that wrong? And, and there are in every state. And so what we're simply saying is, look, lots of us have offered lots of different ideas. We've right. got dozens of Republican ideas offered in the House, in bills, in the Senate. 
And many of us look at the point of the fact that the states, you know, do we distrust our governors? Do we distrust our no. state legislatures? Do we distrust all the state insurance? Yeah, okay, some of you may do that. <laughs> Depends on who it is, but should we regulate all this? Should four people in Washington decide exactly how this works and what you can and cannot buy? Paul, well, so look, look, uh, there's just a difference in philosophy. No, no, no. Look, look it is. I, 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 this, this, is a, uh, this, this is an important point. Um, we've got a couple other people who want to speak. We've gone about 45 minutes uh, on this section. Uh, we're running over because we went long on the uh, opening statements. Ryan. Okay, so. There's Congressman Paul Ryan talking about we want to decentralize the system, that if you make mandates, it drives up the cost, drives down the care. That's you know, essentially what you just heard. Later on that morning, because this is a long, like, this is like six hour meeting, four hour meeting that was held. Uh, so that was around eight o'clock, 8.30 uh, Eastern time. Now, a couple of hours later, Paul Ryan, comes out and has a, l a little bit longer discussion about the Republican proposals as of 2010. Let's take a look. He's going to open this conversation on behalf of us. Thank you. Uh, look, we agree on the problem here, and the problem is health inflation is driving us off of a fiscal cliff. Mr. President, you've said health care reform is budget reform. You're right. We agree with that. Medicare right now has a $38 trillion unfunded liability. That's $38 trillion in empty promises to my parents' generation, our generation, our kids' generation. Medicaid's growing at 21% this year. It's suffocating states' budgets. It's adding trillions in obligations that we have no means to pay for it. Now, you're right to frame the debate on cost and health inflation. And in September, when you spoke to us uh, in the well of the House, you basically said, and I totally agree with this, I will not sign a plan that adds one dime to our deficits, either now or in the future. Uh, since the Congressional Budget Office can't score your bill because it doesn't have sufficient detail, but it tracks very similar to the Senate bill, I want to unpack the Senate score a little bit. Um, and if you take a look at the CBO analysis, analysis from your chief actuary, I think it's very revealing. This bill does not control costs. This bill does not reduce deficits. Instead, this bill adds a new health care entitlement at a time and we have no idea how to pay for the entitlements we already have. Now, let me go through why I say that. Um, the majority leader said the bill scores as reducing the deficit $131 billion over the next 10 years. First, a little bit about CBO. I work with them every single day. Very good people, great professionals. They do their jobs well. But their job is to score what is placed in front of them. And what has been placed in front of them is a bill that is full of gimmicks and smoke and mirrors. Now, what do I mean when I say that? Well, first off, the bill has 10 years of tax increases, about half a trillion dollars, with 10 years of Medicare cuts, about half a trillion dollars, to pay for six years of spending. Now, what's the true 10-year cost of this bill? In 10 years, that's $2.3 trillion. It does a couple of other things. It takes $52 billion in higher Social Security tax revenues and counts them as offsets, offsets but that's really reserved for Social Security. So either we're double counting them or we don't intend on paying those Social Security benefits. It takes $72 billion um, in claims money from the CLASS Act. That's the long-term care insurance program. It takes the money from premiums that are designed for that benefit and instead counts them as offsets. Uh, the Senate Budget Committee chairman said that this is a Ponzi scheme that would make Bernie Madoff proud. Now, when you take a look at the Medicare cuts, what this bill essentially does is treats Medicare like a piggy bank. It raids a half a trillion dollars out of Medicare, not to shore up Medicare solvency, but to spend on this new government program. Now, when you take a look at what this does is, according to the chief actuary of Medicare, he's saying as much as 20% of Medicare's providers will either go out of business or will have to stop seeing Medicare beneficiaries. Millions of seniors who are on and who have chosen Medicare Advantage will lose the coverage that they now enjoy. You can't say that you're using this money to either extend Medicare solvency and also offset the cost of this new program. That's double counting. And so when you take a look at all of this, when you strip out the double counting and what I would call these gimmicks, the full 10-year cost of this bill has a $460 billion deficit. The second 10-year cost of this bill has a $1.4 trillion deficit. 
And I think probably the most cynical gimmick in this bill is something that we all probably agree on. We don't think we should cut doctors 21% next year. We've stopped those cuts from occurring every year for the last seven years. We all call this here in Washington the doc fix. Well, the doc fix, according to your numbers, cost $371 billion. It was in the first iteration of all these bills. But because it was a big price tag and it made the score look bad, made it look like a deficit, that, bill was, that provision was taken out and it's been going on as standalone legislation. But ignoring these costs does not remove them from the backs of taxpayers. Hiding spending does not reduce spending. And so when you take a look at all of this, it just doesn't add up. And so let's just, I'll finish with the cost curve. Are we bending the cost curve down or are we bending the cost curve up? Well, if you look at your own chief actuary at Medicare, we're bending it up. He's claiming that we're going up $222 billion, adding more to the unsustainable fiscal situation we have. And so when you take a look at this, it's really deeper than the deficits or the budget gimmicks or the actuarial analysis. There really is a difference between us. And, and we've been talking about how much we agree on different issues, but there really is a difference between us. And it's basically this. We don't think the government should be in control of all of this. We want people to be in control. And that, at the end of the day, is the big difference. Now, we've offered lots of ideas all last year, all this year, because we agree that status quo is unsustainable. It's got to get fixed. It's bankrupting families. It's bankrupting our government. It's hurting families with pre-existing conditions. We all want to fix this, but we don't think that this is the answer to the solution and all of the analysis we get proves that point. Now, I'll just simply say this, and, and I respectfully disagree with the, with the Vice President about what the American people are or are not saying or whether we're qualified to speak on their behalf. So, uh, we are all representatives of the American people. We all do town hall meetings. We all talk to our constituents. And I've got to tell you, the American people are engaged. And if you think they want a government takeover of health care, I would respectfully submit you're not listening to them. So what we simply want to do is start over, work on a clean shaded paper, move through these issues step by step, and fix them and bring down health care costs and not raise them. And that's basically the point. Uh, I'm going to call on uh, Javier Becerra, but I, I just want to follow up on a couple points. I, 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 I... So that's what you had. That was now Speaker, uh, then Congressman Paul Ryan, speaking February uh, 26, 2010. Um, I'm not going to repeat what he had to say because you just heard it yourself, but I will say this, that the bill in the House, it passed March 21st, 2010, so we're coming up on the seventh anniversary next week, a uh, vote of 219 to 212. March 23rd, will mark the seventh anniversary in which the Affordable Care Act was signed into law by President Barack Obama. So we've had to deal with this for seven years. Now, if you go back into the fall when Minsure was a big political topic, that was a derivative of the Affordable Care Act. And the problems, as, as Congressman Ryan has, has stated seven years ago, the problems have only gotten worse. He was right. Now, Paul Ryan is the Speaker of the House of Representatives. We have a Republican majority in the U.S. Senate. We have a Republican president. But now, and this is the challenge that Speaker Ryan has, how do you go back to February uh, 26, 2010, from where you are today when that bill had passed and been signed into law? That is where we're at in this whole health care debate. The one thing I will tell you this, in order to have a long-term fix, Speaker Ryan, President Trump, Majority Leader McConnell cannot do what was done to them when the original Affordable, Health, Affordable Care Act was passed. They had that big summit, and we just played you, you know, two clips from it. The thing is, none of the Republican suggestions for improving of that bill were enacted. None of them were. So now, what do you have seven years later when the Republicans are in control? They are trying to repeal it. But the double-edged sword for them is if they do not get bipartisan support in long-term fixes, 
The next time the Democrats get control of the House, the Senate, and the White House, they will do the same thing. They will take everything away that Speaker Ryan has been trying to put together, and they will go back and do their own thing. And the problems are only going to get worse. So if you see where conservatives aren't happy with the, with the current model, well, I can understand that because the, I think, and I think uh, Speaker Ryan would probably agree that, yeah, that's kind of what we want to do is what, what uh, like, say, uh, Senator Rand Paul in Kentucky wants to do, but understanding that you still need Democrat support in order to make sure this doesn't get completely repealed when the pendulum swings to the left. So that's why I wanted to take the, take the time today to play these clips for you because this is kind of the baseline of Speaker Ryan's philosophies, and he has a lot of clout in this process. And so I'm hoping that as we advance further in the debate and discussion of this bill and any other provision related to health insurance and health care uh, going through Congress, that we understand that this is what happened seven years ago, and it's going to be interesting for us to watch the process unfold. Now we are going to turn the page. Uh, we are going to give you our Prager U, uh, Prager University segment of today. And we're going to play about Herbert Hoover and the Great Depression. Keep this in the back of your mind when we go through the rest of the program today because the Great Depression had a lot to do with things that had transpired. There's other issues uh, that, that were uh, beforehand that I'm not going to get into in today's show, but keep the Great Depression in mind when you look at what we have for the rest of the show. Mention the name Herbert Hoover, the 31st President of the United States, and you probably think Great Depression. Here's how the usual narrative goes. The stock market crashes in October of 1929. Hoover, a Republican, refuses to intervene. Instead, he lets the free market deal with the problem and the economic downturn morphs into a catastrophic decline. Well, the stock market did crash in 1929, and the economic downturn that followed did lead into the Great Depression. But it wasn't because Hoover was a small government man like his predecessor, Calvin Coolidge. It was just the opposite. My research shows that it was Hoover's incessant meddling, not the mistaken view that he did nothing, that provoked the Great Depression. Hoover, a good man with magnanimous instincts, was a successful mining engineer before he got into government. He believed that almost anything could be engineered, and he brought that philosophy to the economic crisis of 1929. As a result, he was the wrong man for the job at exactly the wrong time. For starters, Hoover distrusted the free market. He knew that unfettered competition forces companies to reduce prices, but he believed lower prices lead to lower wages. In November of 1929, shortly after the stock market swoon, Hoover called a meeting with the CEOs of major American industry. Henry Ford of Ford Motor, Alfred Sloan of GM, and Pierre DuPont of DuPont Chemicals led the group that met with Hoover. The president set down a very clear and unprecedented directive. One, despite the weakening economy, keep wage rates at current levels. Two, minimize layoffs. If you must reduce manpower, do it through work sharing. That is, have two workers work half a day each or every other day. In return for maintaining wage rates and sharing jobs, Hoover promised the CEOs that he would convince workers to neither strike nor demand additional pay or benefits. He kept his promise. Labor agreed not to strike. Industry agreed not to cut wages. In fact, Henry Ford raised wages as a gesture of solidarity. The engineer, it seemed, had engineered the perfect solution, only it didn't work. As 1929 moved into 1930 and 1931, prices for industrial goods declined. One reason was the economy-wide deflation brought on by the Federal Reserve's tight money policy. People simply didn't have money to buy goods or invest in companies. But another reason, and a big one, was the result of something else Hoover did his signing of the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act of 1930. That act, which raised tariffs on imports to the highest levels in 100 years, led America's trading partners to retaliate by placing tariffs on American goods. With American exports cut in half, the prices of American industrial goods declined sharply. As the Depression deepened, industry asked Hoover for permission to cut wages, but Hoover refused. 
If we cut wages, there will be hell to pay with unions, he said. By the end of 1931, with the economy in shambles, industry broke their deal by cutting wages and increasing layoffs. But it was too late to stop the freefall. Business failure built on business failure. Unemployment soared from 3.2% in 1929 to 23.6% in 1932. Hoover countered by vastly increasing government spending, offering a nine-point plan that included major public works projects like the Hoover Dam and the Los Angeles Aqueduct. He raised taxes on the top income bracket from 25% to 63%. He did everything he could think of to engineer the economy back to health except the one thing that might have worked, let the free market heal itself. What should have been a couple of hard years turned into a decade-long disaster. Now, we have the commonly held view that Hoover and Franklin Roosevelt's economic policies were so different. You can now see that view is also inaccurate. Both Hoover and FDR believed in forceful government intervention into the economy. I'm Lee O'Hanion, professor of economics at UCLA for Prager University. Join. And that is what gave us the Great Depression. And there were, it was really bad. Um, my grandparents lived through the Great Depression. When I was growing up, you know, they told me what they had to go through. And it wasn't good. Now, of course, I had grandparents who lived on a farm. So the one thing that they said was that they were able to at least have a roof over their head and they were able to eat the food that they produced, which is what kept them away from really feeling the shocks. But there were others who were living in the cities that were really, really desperate. That was a really big deal. But that was a big deal here in America. It was even worse in Europe. And when you take a look at the fact that they were suffering from a depression actually longer than we were because of the war debt from World War I, Things were really, really bad. And I'll tell you this, when, um, when uh, Adolf Hitler took office, he was elected as chancellor, but the one thing that he, he had done was he had found a common enemy of the people, and it was the Jews. Why was it the Jews? Because he believed that the Jews were responsible for the poor economic condition and that Germans were facing, and it was the Jews who were the ones who had caused that economic crash. And, and I'm, I'm simplif greatly simplifying this. And so he made the Jews to be a common enemy of the people. That was Adolf Hitler. He rose to power, and people really suffered. Now, I hear people in politics today all the time talking about you know, making comparison between this political candidate and that political candidate to Adolf Hitler. I keep hearing po uh, people today saying that so-and-so is a Nazi, so-and-so is a Nazi, this is a Nazi. They haven't studied the history to find out really how bad the Nazis were. That's a real shame. It really, really is because I don't know of anybody in America who is capable of doing the same level of atrocities that the Nazis actually did. So we're going to start this segment with a story that we had covered a few months ago, and we've been paying attention. The story is pretty much over, but this is a reminder that at the Dachau concentration camp, the sign over the gate was stolen. This is a year or two ago, and it was recently returned. Let's take a quick look just to get you realigned in this thinking. The wrought iron gate stolen from Dachau concentration camp in 2014 has been returned. It resurfaced near Bergen, Norway in December last year following an anonymous tip. The gate bearing the famous Nazi slogan, Arbeit macht frei, work sets you free, will be put on display at a Holocaust museum in the former camp in Upper Bavaria, Germany. A replica put in place in 2015 will remain at the entrance to Dachau. So the, the, the sign over the gate has been returned. But when you watch the rest of the video clips, and we look not just at Dachau but at Auschwitz, Keep a close watch on the sign. Let that image get burned into your mind. 
because what they experienced was absolutely horrific. That is why it's called a Holocaust. And we actually do have a Minnesota connection to this that we're going to get into just a little bit later. And then, of course, that psychological question. So let's take a look now a little bit more at the history of the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. survived. Some of them still live among us today. survivor from the Auschwitz concentration camp and he went back a couple of years ago and really gave a compelling story. Here is Mr. Arbreiter right now.
over here, this is the this is the box cars that we came in with. And then over here, as we came out from the box cars, was the assembling of the people right here. And that's where Mangalas or one of the other doctors performed the selection. Now when the selection took place over here and the groups were divided, we were just ordered to walk. But we didn't know which direction, which one is going where. My column was ordered to walk right here, this way. As we were walking here, this line, we were guarded on both sides by assessment with machine guns and dogs. And we were walking, as you can see, that long walk there into the unknown. We just kept walking all the way to the very end, and that's where the tragedy begins over there. That comes back to me even after so many years, what took place here. When they came and people and the guest chambers were busy, which was practical on a daily basis, the people sometimes you see were sitting in so what called the waiting area until there is room for them in the guest chambers to be able to go in and to be killed. And so this is called Zhenki. And that's, they were sitting and waiting. The waiting room, can you imagine? The waiting room to be taken in, to be killed. Oh, there's so many stories to tell from here. If this area if these three, if this ground, if that ground over there could only talk. What, what took place on this, on this area is just unbelievable, undescribable. See this here, these bricks? Crematorium three, crematorium four. This was crematorium four. And this is where they were bringing up the bodies. The people that were working in the crematoriums were hardened uh, prisoners that were working in every single day and they knew what was going in inside. And sometimes they even worked on bodies of their own relatives. But they said the hardest and the most difficult thing was when they had to do a transport of children when you had children walking up, little children up to probably about 10 years old, and when they also nicely, quietly helped them in into the guest chambers, and those little things were crying and screaming for their mothers, you know how, how little children are. And then when they closed the, the, the doors, they were banging, the little kids were banging on the walls, on the doors, screaming for their mothers. and. Uh, Sergeant Moll throwing the gas and um, and quite little by little, little by little, the noise inside quiet down and one by one they lay down there on the cement floor and went to sleep. This was this was the oven, right over here. That was the narrow walk to the bunks. The bunks were located like this, three tiers high. Right about over here was my bunk, where I was, where I was laying over here. When the trains arrived here, we came out from the trains. My family was murdered, my father, my mother, my seven-year-old brother. And I was here and then in 1944, at the end of 44. And this is a very good thing that the people are doing, that bringing you here. To, <laughs> well, it is to learn so the young people can learn 
and know what took place because you are going to with all your beautiful faces you're going to be the leaders the future leaders of Slovakia and uh, leaders of the world the United Nations the leaders of the world and you might have in the future the power to prevent place like this to exist so again it's an honor for me to speak with you to meet you enjoy the day enjoy your life and go home and tell your parents your families what you learned, what you saw here. And remember that only good people can prevent a catastrophe like this, what took place here, from happening again. Learn what you see and remember what you learn. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you, thank you. I still cannot imagine today that this is the truth, that this is what happened here in the 20th century in the heart of Europe, in, in one of the most cultural advanced countries, that people could commit such atrocities. Well, now we're gonna turn this around. Now that you've seen the victim of Nazi atrocities, let's take a look at the same type of deal through the lens of somebody who was a former Nazi. Let's take a look at what happened four years ago when we discovered that there was a Nazi living among us in Minneapolis. Here's the story. Documents from 1968 show he gave the order to attack a village where dozens of men, women, and children were killed. But the man's family says those accusations are absurd. In June, 94-year-old Michael Karkos was the center of an AP investigation which accused him of being a Nazi commander. The Ukrainian national has been living in Minneapolis now for decades. Our Steve Tellier is here with the latest developments today. Steve? Bill, today the prosecutor leading the investigation says he will recommend state prosecutors in Germany pursue murder charges against Karkos. The AP also says it has finally found the smoking gun that proves he ordered the killing of innocents. On Monday, the AP revealed new evidence, a file containing an interview from the 1960s with a man who said he was under Karkos's command. That soldier said a commander who went by the name Wolf gave the order to attack a Polish village where dozens died. Karkos also went by the nickname Wolf. It seems that there is evidence to pursue charges. Alejandro Baer, a sociologist and director of the University of Minnesota Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, says Karkos could and should be prosecuted if the evidence supports it. If it is proven that this person has committed these crimes, he should be brought before justice. Five Eyewitness News has been digging into Karkos's past as well. This is the paperwork from when he emigrated to the U.S. in 1949. He lists his occupation as laborer and when asked whether he completed any military service prior to or during World War II, he replied simply, no. His naturalization papers show he applied for U.S. citizenship 10 years later. We have also investigated the first person to accuse Karkos, a London man named Stephen Ankier. He's an amateur Nazi hunter who has made similar accusations in the past, but none have led to charges. This is a picture of Ankier we found online, but we found almost no other trace of him. Still, the case could soon turn into a criminal one, and according to Bayer, a signal to all who would do harm. It is both an issue of justice, and it's an issue of that acting otherwise would offer today's perpetrators carte blanche to uh, commit atrocities. We also reached out to Karkos's family today and they declined to comment, but they have previously vehemently denied the 94-year-old has any connection to Nazi Germany whatsoever. His family says Karkos was forced to join the German army after fleeing the Soviet invasion of the Ukraine and deserted soon thereafter so he could join a group of nationalists fighting for Ukrainian independence. He denies having any active or passive role in any atrocities. If he is charged, it would likely take years for Germany to extradite him. Bill? Okay, thank you, Steve. Well, Minnesota Senator. So we have a Nazi around, around us. Um, what was the response from the Jewish community in Minneapolis when they heard about it? Let's take a look. Can you lay out what, who exactly Michael Karkach is? He's a retired carpenter, 94 years old from 
Minneapolis, who entered this country in 1949, apparently was naturalized as a citizen in 1959, and incongruously, with respect to his alleged past activities, he lived a fairly quiet, sedate, and private life mm. in Minneapolis ever since. And what's been the reaction of the Jewish community in Minnesota upon hearing about this man in their midst? Shock, disgust, it's appalling. Keeping in mind that the alleged massacres in which he participated involved both Jews and non-Jews, it's a Minnesota connection to the depravity of Nazism in Poland. Millions of Jews were killed, millions of non-Jews were killed by Germans, and we certainly keep that in mind here in Minnesota. These are allegations. They have not yet been verified by any uh, judicial process. So we just have to take it with a bit of a grain of salt mm -hmm. and uh, go on presumption of innocence. But if they are true, then as with other Nazi war criminals who were found to uh, have entered this country illegally by lying on their visa applications, uh, Mr. Karkoch ought to be um, deported and sent to a country where he can be brought to justice and can, can stand trial for the crimes of which uh, he may be accused. my father's side. For Eva Gross, the Holocaust never feels far away. She sees it in the pictures on her wall, the numbers on her wrist. All those memories, it will, will never go away. She especially remembers those she lost, grandparents on both sides, aunts, cousins, a father. I cannot comprehend of losing so much of the family and I was really I had very close relationship with my grandparents. But Eva and her mother survived and in 1948 moved to the United States. All we want to do is just establish a normal life. And now Eva learns her life here in Minnesota was somewhat shared by someone now accused of committing Holocaust crimes. You're shocked and appalled. Steve Hunnigs with the Jewish Community Relations Council says survivors and others in the Minnesota Jewish community today hope for more answers and prosecution. There's no statute of limitations for murder. The same applies for those involved in the crimes of the Holocaust. And they cut off our head, put on the numbers. For Eva, the need to share her story is great. What hate could create. And today, so with her hope, justice will come to even one in Minnesota. Wouldn't bring back my family or, or, or the suffering of people, but I think that there should be some justice. So now you've seen from the Jewish perspective their attitudes towards one man. But one man who did some horrendous things 75 years ago. Now, because the, um, I can't remember his name right now, but the accused uh, has not really made a statement. We don't know from his side of the story exactly what went on. The thing that I'm always wondering is, has it haunted him for these 75 years? What he did in 1943, has it haunted him yet? And that's something that only he knows. But sometimes bringing up on charges and condemning to die is actually the easy way out. This man is 98 years old. Where, on one hand, we want to see justice for something done a long time ago. On the other hand, is he not already living a mental hell? I'm not taking sides in this. Because I don't know the answer, and thankfully I'm not the judge, jury, or executioner. I'm really glad I don't have that responsibility. Um, let's take a look at the investigations that have ongoing. First, take a look at Germany. Uh, and keep in mind, in Germany, after the war, they really got punitive about the SS and, and Nazis because this was their legacy. This is how the rest of the world viewed them. And so Germany, the German people, after the war, wanted to clean up their act, and they still take Nazi war crimes really seriously. Let's take a look at what the government of Germany had to say. Yeah, hi, I'm Steve Karnowski. I'm a reporter with the Associated Press. We want to check Hey, 
it's dark, there is fresh information to this defamation. Uh, this is actually a, uh, a Nazi uh, SS list, and it, it includes all of their, the various companies uh, that were in, that were in this uh, unit, and the, their commanders and their and their ranks, dates of birth, all the information, it, and basically their their pay grade. It's a payroll list, so far as we know. This is Karkwatch's own name uh, listed, and you see he's the lieutenant, and he's the head of the second company of this uh, of this uh, group born in 1919 um, the latest is, is that we've discovered new testimony from a private in his company a guy named Ivan Sharko who specifically testified that Karkots not only was at the scene of the massacre in 1944 but that he'd also ordered his troops to attack the village um, he did not specify that they that they had or been ordered to kill men women and children but what we do know is that they did in the end kill more than 40 civilians in the massacre um, this clearly says that yes indeed he was at the scene and in fact had given the order so he was there in a command uh, position. Um, what we've also just learned is, is that uh, federal prosecutors in Germany uh, say that they've collected enough evidence to, um, in an investigation that they began after our initial story to uh, recommend to state prosecutors that they pursue murder charges against Karkots. Um, that could still take some time. It has to be determined, first of all, which state prosecutors that it goes to, um, and then that, then they have to review the evidence and determine whether there's enough to charge him and whether Germany has the jurisdiction to prosecute him. And ultimately, the government of Germany declined to prosecute. But now the story actually made its way back in the newspapers and on the TV just this past week. The government of Poland has made the decision that they're going to seek to extradite him from Minneapolis to bring him under trial. Let's take a look. Polish authorities say they'll seek the arrest and extradition of a U.S. citizen suspected of committing crimes against humanity during the Second World War. Michael Kay, identified during an Associated Press investigation as Michael Karkotz, is accused of being a Nazi commander in an SS-led unit that raised Polish villages and killed at least 44 civilians. This prosecutor says this case shows that there's at least still a chance of bringing those responsible to justice. We should never stop pursuing suspects. Evidence allegedly points to the now 98-year-old Karkots leading a unit in the Ukrainian Self-Defense Legion and ordering killings in eastern Poland in 1944. His son denies he was involved in any war crimes. The fact that the Associated Press was handed a dubious of uh, a 1968 KGB interrogation file of dubious origins does not qualify as evidence or proof. Polish prosecutors are now seeking an arrest warrant for the Minneapolis resident, saying his age would not stop the investigation. So herein lies the question. He was 25 years old when he did that. He's 98 years old today. And we talk about wanting to bring to justice. You know, he moved on with his life. He has a family, at least we know he's got two sons. And is there any forgiveness in this? Or is what he did so bad that even at the age of 98, that justice shall be served and will be served and he may be executed? I don't have an answer to this. Um, this is perplexing to me. And that's it goes back with other... Uh, things with the Nazis. They conducted thousands of medical experiments on live human beings. Now the question is still being debated today. Do we take the results of those experiments and turn them into something good because the sacrifice had already been made and that we can uh, learn from that? Or is it because of that sacrifice that we don't even want to touch any of the data and make use of that and turn it into something that might be used for good. And people are still debating that issue. And until the last World War II veteran, the last Nazi, the last Holocaust survivor has passed away naturally, we're never going to really get to the end of that situation. But that's why I want to bring up the psychological impact, because what happened 75, 80 years ago 
is still with us today. And that's something that in the modern discourse of politics in America, we throw around this term Nazi, I think a little too loosely. That we really need to spend some time to reflect on what the Nazis really, really did. Because I don't know of anybody, Republican, Democrat, Green, Constitutional, uh, Constitution Party, Libertarian Party, Socialist Workers Party, I don't know of anybody in America who is capable of living up to the atrocities that the Nazis in Germany in the 1930s and 40s had actually done. So I'm hoping that if you're engaged in a political discussion, please don't call your opponent a Nazi, especially if they're an American citizen. We're going to take uh, our musical segment as a uh, piece of piano music, and we're going to finish up in memory of all of those who died during the Holocaust. For Dallas Pearson, producer, I'm your host, Jeff Williams. You're watching North Star Oasis, reminding you that we have 283 more shopping days left until Christmas, even fewer till Hanukkah. Thanks for watching. See you next week.